Hello, everyone, and welcome to NOAA's OMICS seminar series. My name is Tracy Gill, and along with Catherine Egan, we are the webinar co-hosts for this series. Before we get started, here are a few logistics, also listed in the chat box. For this webinar, we have two presentations, and the presenters will address your questions and comments at the end of each presentation. All attendees are muted, but feel free to type your questions and comments into the chat box at any time. If you want to go to full screen or a larger slide view, find the four arrow button to the upper right of the slide deck and hit it. This four arrow button toggles the full screen view on and off. If you are interested in getting a copy of the recording or a PDF of the slides, we will send them out a day or two after the talk to all who are registered. If you are not on the weekly NOAA Science Seminar email list but you'd like to be, please contact me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I will add you to the list. And thanks a lot to our captioner today for making this webinar more accessible. And now I will pass the mic to my co-host, Catherine Egan, to introduce the NOAA OMIC series and today's webinar title and presenters. Catherine? Thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate that. And hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Welcome to the NOAA OMIC seminar series. As Tracy stated, I am your co-host, Catherine Egan. I am the OAR OMICS coordinator for the Oceans Portfolio, and I currently sit in NOAA Ocean Exploration. I also sit on the NOAA OMICS Working Group. The OMICS Seminar Series is hosted by two NOAA groups, NOAA Ocean Exploration and the National Ocean Service, through the One NOAA Science Seminar Series. Tracy Gill and I will be co-hosting the OMICS Seminars, and I will be moderating the questions today. <clears throat> OMIC, which is a suite of tools used to analyze DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolites, has become a large priority here at NOAA in the last few years. We established this seminar series in an effort to increase transparency and collaboration and highlight the incredible OMICS-related research currently underway both within and outside NOAA. So with that, we have two OMICS presentations today. We will have our first speakers present and then we will take, uh, take questions after that presentation. We will then begin the second presentation at around 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The first presentation is titled, Omics as a Tool for Exploring Bacterial Network, a Coral Disease Case Study, presented by Dr. Rebecca Sertner and Dr. Sarah Williams. Dr. Sertner is, a, uh, is the Competition Manager, NEPA Staff Lead, and Federal Program Officer for the NOAA National Sea Grant Office, she is also a member of the NOAA OMICS Working Group. <clears throat> Becca holds a PhD in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology from Northeastern University. Her dissertation focused on white fan disease in critically endangered Caribbean corals, particularly bacterial population structure, quorum sensing, and gene expression. We also have Dr. Williams joining us today, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Coral Health and Disease Program at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. Dr. Williams started at Moat in 2020, shortly after completing her PhD at Northeastern University, also in ecology, evolution, and marine biology. She uses network science and modeling combined with fieldwork and physiological experiments to attack problems facing coral reefs from multiple angles. She studies the connections among polyps in a coral colony the associations of coral species and their symbiotic algae and microbiome, and the spread of coral diseases, all under the lens of global climate change. So thank you so much, Becca and Sarah, for presenting today. I will now pass it off to Becca to start. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, it looks like my sound is working, so let me know if that's not the case, and I will just get started. Um, so, like Catherine said, my name is Rebecca Sertner, and I'm the Competitions Manager uh, with Sea Grant, and I also sit on the NOAA OMICS Working Group. Um, so, this project grew out of one of the chapters of my PhD dissertation, and if you're interested in that chapter, it was published in 2018 in Environmental Microbiology. But, as you can see, um, I know Sarah Williams from graduate school. We go way back. Um, this is a photo of us at a department outreach event for local kids. I'm on the right with the Acropora, my favorite corals. 
Um, and as a network scientist, um, Sarah was interested in data sets that could use network science to explore microbial dynamics in corals. So we teamed up for this project to take um, my previous analyses to the next level. So I'd like to start very broadly and introduce the concept of a holobiont. So a holobiont is a community of organisms that make up an ecological unit. And within the holobiont is the microbiome. The microbiome is a community of microorganisms found on within that ecological unit. So if you take humans, for example, humans are holobionts because our bodies contain many different species. And within the human holobiont, there's also a microbiome. And corals are very similar. Uh, the coral animal is a holobiont, and corals also contain a microbiome within their holobiont. So the coral holobiont includes three major parts. First is the coral animal. Next are the symbiotic dinoflagellates, known as zooxanthellae. And finally, there are the microbes. So the microbes include bacteria, archaea, and viruses. Um, and so we know that breakdowns in the relationship between corals and zooxanthellae leads to bleaching. However, unlike zooxanthellae, we don't know quite as much about coral microbes. However, we do know that breakdowns in that particular relationship between corals and their bacteria lead to coral disease. So the coral holobiont is a really good example of a complex system of interactions among coral animals, their algal symbionts, and their bacteria. So networks help us understand such complex systems like the coral holobiont by providing an analytical structure that can be used across systems and disciplines. And so for those of you not familiar, I want to give first a quick uh, overview of networks. So a network represents a system of components or nodes and their interactions, which are the links. So for example, in a food web, the species of the nodes and the predation interactions are the links. Um, uh, so for example, the coral holobiont has a network of interactions between the coral, the symbionts, and the bacteria. So coral holobiont networks contain multiple individual corals who all associate with a diverse set of zooxanthellae and bacteria. And as you all are probably uh, aware, these complex systems are facing multiple stressors. But today we're just going to focus on the coral animal host and its microbial interactions. So like I mentioned before, breakdowns in the relationship between corals and bacteria lead to disease. Along with overfishing and, and uh, coral bleaching, coral disease is one of the biggest threats to coral reefs worldwide. However, unlike bleaching, uh, coral disease is much, well, uh, much less understood. Um, as you all probably know, it's increasing in frequency and severity um, around the world across many reef systems. And coral disease is correlated with climate change and other anthropogenic impacts. And, uh, Many of you are also probably aware that NOAA is doing a lot of work on coral disease, particularly right now um, with stony coral tissue loss disease in Florida and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, the focus of this talk will be white band disease, however, which is also found in Florida and the Caribbean. So white band disease affects the two Caribbean acropoids, Acropora cervicornis up top there and Acropora palmata on the bottom. In 1979, an outbreak of white band disease led to the loss of over 95% of these extremely important reef-building corals, landing them both on the endangered species list. So like all coral diseases, um, a lot is unknown. Uh, they're, they're difficult to study. However, with white band disease, um, research has told us over the past few decades that the pathogen is likely bacterial. The disease is transmissible through the water through certain animal vectors um, like snails and zooplankton, and through coral-to-coral -coral contact. So we can consider coral disease as a stressor or perturbation that the coral microbial network is facing. So the central question in network science is how does network structure affect the system's resistance and resilience to stressors? And how will the network change and respond to these changes? So worded slightly differently, this is also a central area of coral research. How does the coral microbiome respond to different stressors? 
So in this talk, we're going to address two general research questions. First, how does the coral microbiome change during disease progression? So we're going to answer this question using typical methods in the coral disease field. And this is uh, what I answered in my dissertation and in um, the paper that I wrote. So namely, we're going to use 16S metagenomic sequencing and um, sub typical subsequent analyses that uh, usually go along with uh, those types of techniques. However, um, Sarah and I wanted to push our analysis further with the second question. So what more can we learn about this system by taking a network science approach? And we hope to show um, how network science can be paired with um, omics techniques and sort of more traditional um, um, uh, analyses to explore complex microbiomes um, that you get with coral disease. All right, so for uh, this experiment, uh, healthy and diseased corals were collected um, from Bocas del Toro, Panama in February of 2015. So diseased corals were homogenized to create a white band disease treatment. So this basically means that um, the tissue was stripped off of these coral fragments using glass beads uh, and filtered seawater, and then that um, whole tissue fraction was filtered to get the bacterial fraction. And another treatment was uh, just created using filtered seawater. And these two treatments were dosed onto healthy coral fragments uh, in aquaria. And I used um, 30 coral fragments from 30 different uh, colonies to eliminate any effect of genotype. Now, just to share some initial results um, from that experiment, um, in this figure, we have the two treatments. We have disease in seawater. Um, so on the y-axis, you can see the higher uh, the bar from that treatment, the more corals die from that treatment. So you see here that the seawater treatment has a pretty low mortality, and the disease treatment has 100% mortality. Um, so subsequent figures will sort of mirror these colors and will always show the disease treatments in red and the seawater treatment in black. So based on the previous uh, figure, we know that we can transmit um, disease from white band disease-associated bacteria to healthy corals. So now, um, using 16S metagenomics techniques, we're going to look at our first qu uh, research question. And we want to look at specifically how the microbiome changes during disease progression. So um, essentially, the goal of this question is to establish a disease microbiome and look at um, the characteristics that are associated with that microbiome. So like I said, for that, um, we really focused on using 16S metagenomic sequencing. So um, this technique, if you haven't heard of it before, sequences the highly conserved 16S rRNA gene. And this is um, conserved across all uh, bacteria. So within this conserved gene, however, there are several hypervariable regions that you can kind of see in this figure here. Um, and these hypervariable regions vary greatly between uh, bacterial uh, species. So we can use these hypervariable regions to do phylogenetic studies. So depending on the sequence of a certain portion of the hypervariable region, we can use that specific sequence to identify um, different species of bacteria. So let's go back to the experimental design. Um, so remember that we dose healthy corals in aquaria um, with a seawater or a disease treatment. However, um, during the course of this experiment, I also took polyp samples from the uh, uh, healthy corals in the aquarium at three time points. So the first time point was uh, time zero before any dosing occurred. The second time point, time point one, was um, 12 hours post-dosage, and then finally a time point two at 24 hours post-dosage. So the 12-hour sampling um, time occurred before any disease signs appeared in the corals that ultimately got disease. And the 24-hour sampling occurred um, just when very early disease signs were starting to show on the corals that would eventually succumb to white band disease. So here's an overview of the general um, 16S pipeline that I used. So first, I extracted all DNA from those uh, polyp, those holobiont samples from the coral polyps. 
Sorry, I had a pop-up come on the screen there. Um, then I uh, did a 16S library prep. Um, samples were multiplexed, and we chose to um, uh, sequence the V4 hypervariable region of the 16S gene. So the sequencing platform I used was Illumina. I used the uh, HiSeq 2500 platform. So reads coming out of that platform um, were put into a bioinformatics pipeline. So first, low-quality uh, reads were removed, and then the reads were put into the Chime pipeline. I clustered the reads at 97%, uh, which gave me 4,283 individual OTUs. And then I performed a number of different analyses, including a differential abundance analysis um, using the R package metagenome seed. So um, let's look at the results from those analyses. So first I want to show you a PCOA plot, which shows the two treatments, uh, seawater and disease, at time 0, time 1, and time 2. So remember um, time 1 is 12 hours post-dosage and time 2 is 24 hours post-dosage. So for those of you unfamiliar um, with these types of plots, each dot is a coral microbiome. So it's one, it's one sample in its microbiome. So dots that are closer together are more similar, and dots that are further apart are more different from each other. So again, um, black points are corals dosed with seawater, and red points are corals dosed with disease. So unsurprisingly, you can see here at time zero, before any dosing happened, um, the treatments are indistinguishable. However, um, we can see really quickly, even before disease signs actually show up phenotypically in the coral, the microbiome is already uh, really significantly different. You can see that in the, in the middle figure there, where the disease microbiome is uh, very clearly clustering together and the healthy, um, the corals that remain healthy um, clustering in a different area. So the microbiome changes very quickly when um, disease progression begins. And this trend um, just continues really strongly um, as the disease matures. So another 16S result um, involves bacterial diversity. So I looked at the Shannon diversity indices, which is the alpha diversity um, at the two time points post-dosage. So again, in these figures, the um, uh, black colored box plot represents corals dosed with seawater, and the red box plot represents corals dosed with uh, disease. So uh, I didn't include time zero, but at time zero, these two box plots are statistically um, the same, indistinguishable. Um, but as you can see, at time one, it sort of mirrors the PCOA plot. Even before uh, disease signs show up, um, the diversity of the disease-dosed uh, coral microbiome jumps. And again, this trend um, just continues um, at time two at 24 hours. So finally, I'd like to take... Um, this is the last figure from the, uh, the more traditional analyses. I'd like to take a look at what species are actually making up that high disease diversity that we see. So we see a significant difference in the bacterial species that are differentially abundant in disease dose versus seawater corals. And this figure right here um, is a figure of the microbiomes from time two, but time one looked very similar. Um, so as you can see, several bacterial families are more associated with the disease microbiome, and you get your usual suspects that we see across tons of coral disease studies. You have your uh, flavobacteria, you have your vibrios, you have your um, rhodobacteria, you have your colwelliaceae, your ultramonodaceae, and pseudoaltramonodaceae. And those should look familiar to you for those of you studying uh, these types of diseases. Um, and the seawater dose corals and the coral, or the corals that stayed healthy do not contain these species in significant numbers. Um, actually, the only bacteria more associated um, with seawater corals were endozoic ammonis, which have been um, associated with uh, healthy corals as a potential coral, potentially um, a, a probiotic in uh, several studies. Okay, so like I said, the previous results are all from um, the sort of more traditional 16S analyses, differential abundance analyses, diversity analyses. However, in order to take advantage of the temporal aspect of this data, we decided to use networks in order to better explore disease progression over time. So the following bacterial co-occurrence networks were constructed using the R package Speakeasy, 
and the sparse inverse covariance estimation for ecological association inferences. So there are uh, quite a lot of methods out there for creating correlation-based um, uh, networks. And the SpeakEasy method reduces spurious results produced by traditional correlation analyses like the Pearson correlation. So the SpeakEasy um, method produces networks where a link between any two nodes implies that the taxa abundances are not conditionally independent and that there is um, a relationship between them that can't be better explained by a different network construction. So basically, in plain language, um, that means with SpeakEasy, um, you end up with fewer links, but we're more confident in the links that are there. So um, we create, Sarah created networks of taxa at the family level for each time point in treatment. So that resulted in six bacterial co-occurrence networks with 174 unique bacterial families present in the data set. So here we can start to visualize the results. So um, in these two figures, as you can see, we have the um, uh, disease time zero at top and seawater time zero on the bottom. The circles slash nodes are the bacterial families. Um, the size of the circle is related to that family's relative abundance in that sample, uh, in that network, and the color is related to bacterial class. So links, uh, the lines, are significant co-occurrences as determined by the speakeasy method. And isolated nodes were not visualized in these networks unless they had very high abundances. Um, so basically any family, bacterial family that was greater than 5% of the sample. So um, not surprisingly, at time zero, kind of follows our other results, um, the two treatments, um, the networks are indistinguishable. So at time one, remember, which is 12 hours post-dosage before any disease signs uh, showed up, the seawater treatment remains pretty much the same as it did at time zero. However, on the other hand, um, the disease treatment network shows a marked increase in uh, diversity. So as you can see, we have more low abundant taxa up here and that are, uh, are much more highly connected. So you can see way more uh, circles connected by way more lines. This um, mirrors pretty well the results that seen in the traditional Shannon diversity method, but here we can actually visualize the connections and look at the particular families that are connected to each other. Um, we also see that the disease candidates um, increase in abundance, but interestingly, they don't have significant co-occurrences with other taxa. They sort of appear on their own. Um, the exception in this, uh, this figure, this top figure here, um, the white band disease time one, is flavobacteria and rhodobacteria, which significantly co-occur together through a third party. So moving on to time two, we simply see um, a real strengthening of the pattern that we saw in time one. So as you can see in this, this top um, figure here, um, there are even more low abundant taxa that have even more connections. So we're just getting more and more diverse and more and more connected and more complicated network. Um, interestingly, still, the disease candidates are mostly um, still isolated, and even flavobacteria and rhodobacteriosity have broken, uh, broken apart at this point. Um, and another thing to mention is that the seawater time to the um, network is still pretty much the same level of connectedness as it was at time one as, um, as it was at time zero as well. So this table is simply a numerical summary of the um, networks I just presented to you. And you'll notice that the seawater treatment doesn't change very much over time and is similar to disease time zero. However, um, the subsequent disease time points um, show um, more total nodes, more connected nodes, more links, and greater clustering um, than any of the seawater treatments. Um, so clustering basically measures the probability that a node's neighbors are connected when um, that a node's neighbors are connected, and when calculated for the network, it indicates how densely connected the network is. So here's just more evidence that um, the network gets um, more complicated with more rare taxa and gets more connected over time, and um, the trend increases through time. So time two is more connected than time one. And then a final figure um, 
about these networks. Um, this figure further visualizes how similar or dissimilar the treatment networks are to each other. So this figure is similar to a PCOA plot, but it relies more on measuring um, uh, the distance between co-occurrences. So the Hamming graph distance measures the number of link substitutions needed to make one network topologically the same as another, and is a measure of network dissimilarity. So put another way, the Hamming distance measures the number of link deletions or insertions necessary to turn um, one network into another. So it's a measure of local changes. So for this figure, um, Hamming distances were transformed to a zero to one scale, zero um, being the blue. Let's see here. Oops, my arrow is not working. But um, zero being the blue here and um, uh, one being the orange. So more dissimilar is going to be orange and more similar is going to be blue. Um, yeah, so a blue square means that the two co-occurrence networks um, that meet at that box are very similar to each other, and an orange square means the two co-occurrence networks are very different. So as you can see, the um, seawater networks stay similar to each other over time. You can see that in these black boxes. You see a lot of blue squares. Um, so all of the seawater networks are similar to each other, um, whether despite the time point that they come from. Um, and disease times zero is also similar to the seawater network. However, on the other hand, the networks from disease time one and disease time two are very different from um, disease time zero control, and um, they're also very different from the seawater network. They're also different from each other. You can see that um, uh, disease time two is um, moving away from disease time one. You can see these with these two very bright orange squares. So what can we take away from this new uh, way of looking at 16S data, even with these very preliminary um, results? Um, this hasn't been, we haven't fully explored this, Sarah and I, but network analysis um, on the surface seems to be a great way to assess complex system dynamics when you really have to take a system-wide approach. Um, the networks confirm and expand upon many of the results we find with the more typical analyses that um, and seen over the last few years, like the differential abundance analyses and the diversity analyses, um, and PCA plus. Um, so first, increased microbial diversity um, during disease um, progression is seen in both alpha diversity and network analyses. Also, similar uh, structural and population differences are seen when assessing similarities of both microbial communities and co-occurrences. However, the importance of the low abundant taxa is much clearer in the network. With the more traditional analyses, we see the same high abundance taxa over and over and over again when it comes to coral disease. The taxa like Vibrios, Rhodobacters, um, Alteromonads, um, Flavobacteria. So um, I posit to you that potentially could these high abundance taxa be masking significant dynamics that are going on in the rare taxa? and sort of their um, explosion during coral disease, could that be covering up some more um, interesting or important dynamics that are going on then underneath? So the network analyses that I showed you really reveal um, that in increasing interconnectedness is a hallmark of disease progression. We really haven't been able to drill down into what that means. Um, so these analyses are going to allow us to peek into the activities of those rare taxa, and you can get a look at all the taxa at once to get a more complete picture of what's going on. And with that, I um, would like to thank the following people as well as uh, Sarah for helping me put together this talk and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, any questions on the network analysis, I'm going to direct to her. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Becca. Really interesting topic and really interesting research project. We have time for maybe one question before we move on to Gary's presentation. Um, so I really encourage you all to take a moment and think if you have any questions and please type them into the chat box and I can read them off for our presenters. We can also um, Save time for questions 
after our next presentation as well, if you all would like to mull it over. So I'll wait just a minute to see if there are any questions before we move on. Okay. All right, so we will go ahead and move on to our next presentation, and we'll save questions for both presentations towards the end. So thank you so much, Becca and Sarah. Really appreciate it. Um, and with that, we will now move on to uh, Gary's presentation. So this is titled, Omics Identifies Strong Population Differentiation and the Underlying Genomic Architecture in Lingcod. Um, so, as I stated, presented by Dr. Gary Longo. So, Dr. Longo uses omics tools to better understand the processes driving intraspecific and interspecific diversification in marine fishes. His PhD research at the University of California, Santa Cruz, utilized population genomics and phylogenomics to better understand adaptation and speciation in surf perches. He is currently an NRC postdoctoral researcher associate, research associate, excuse me, at the NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, working on population genomics in Pacific ground fishes to help inform assessment and management efforts. So thank you so much, Gary, for taking some time and present today. And now I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. So yeah, today uh, I'm going to share some relatively recent findings from our range-wide population genetic study in Lincoln. And as the title implies, uh, we use omics to first identify pretty strong population differentiation, and then again use omics to better understand the genomic architecture behind that that strong population differentiation. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen a link on this handsome devil is a, a male guarding a clutch of eggs. So although, although today's talk focuses on genetics, the big picture goal here is to improve future link on stock assessments by providing crucial data on regional differences in life history traits and demographic rates. Uh, as well as genetic variation throughout the range. And this was a Herculean effort to collect samples, thousands of samples all throughout the range by a bunch of different people and a couple of great organizations. And I just wanted to thank everyone up front for everything. So why Lincoln? So not shockingly, uh, this is NOAA, and we're the National Marine Fishery Service. So these guys are a federally managed fish. They're uh, a West Coast ground fish member. In 2016, there were over 1,600 metric tons landed, uh, worth over $1.6 million. On the recreational side, they're also a critically important target for the charter fishing industry in Washington, Oregon, and California. If you go out on charter boats uh, down in this neck of the woods, people will often go out to target rockfish and ring cod. Um, they're really fun to catch and quite tasty, and this is one of my collaborators, Greg Williams, who also loves wing cod. So the fishery is currently managed uh, in two different regions. We have a northern region, which consists of Washington and Oregon, and a southern region, which consists of California. And so what we're looking at here are, is from the most recent stock assessment, looking at spawning biomass depletion over time. And what you can see is that both the southern and northern stock crashed in the late 90s. Both were designated over fish in 1999, and the fishery was closed temporarily. However, the stocks rebounded really quickly and were declared rebuilt in 2005. However, there's evidence that from the most recent stock assessment that the south stock was prematurely declared rebuilt. So this stock assessment includes data that we collected, and it shows that in fact, when the southern stock was uh, declared rebuilt, it was still below that minimum size threshold and uh, is currently still in the precautionary zone. So just keep this in mind as we go through the results. The southern stock, although it does face 
stronger fishing pressures. Uh, it looks to have had a slower recovery. So there has been previous population work done uh, on lingcod using a flavor of different markers, uh, allozymes, mitochondrial DNA, and microsatellites have all been used. And these markers are uh, noticeably different from OMIC's markers in that in the case of mitochondrial DNA, you're only really looking at uh, basically a single locus. And for allodynes, you, you're looking at maybe a few and then maybe a dozen in microsatellites. Whereas in omics, you're generally using thousands of markers uh, to, to sample throughout the genome. But the big take-home message from all these previous studies is they, they generally suggest no significant structure. So what we're looking at here is a CO1 haplotype cladogram from Marco et al. in 2007. And uh, you can see that this big um, black square represents the most common haplotype shared across all sites. And we don't really see too much evidence of uh, any structure throughout that. So what we did is uh, we decided to sample all throughout the range. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but Lincod range all the way from the Aleutian Islands all the way down to central Baja in the North Pacific. So quite a large range. And that long list of collaborators I showed in the beginning, they're great. They delivered a ton of samples right to our doorstep, basically. But honestly, it was really, really fun getting to go out into the field and actually fish for some Lincod. So um, this is myself and uh, Krista Nichols, who's my postdoc advisor here at the center out in southeast Alaska. And a uh, little known trick for making fish look bigger is to only be five foot seven, and then the fish look gigantic. So just a quick outline of the analyses we conducted for this study. Um, not surprisingly, we used an omics technique. Uh, we, we generated genome-wide RAD-seq markers. And RAD-seq stands for restriction site associated DNA markers. It's become a very common and uh, uh, powerful tool for non-model organisms. I won't go through all the filtering steps, but I'm happy to talk about that or answer questions and emails down the road. But we ended up with over 16,000 polymorphic loci and 611 individuals. And we used these data to investigate uh, population structure with some standard analyses. Uh, we then saw some really strong structure and performed outlier scans to look for divergent loci, and then wanted to better understand where these divergent loci fell out on the genome. So we constructed a draft link high genome and then mapped our RAD-seq loci back to that. So getting into results. So here we're looking at a structure plot. And Structure is a program that uses a Bayesian clustering approach to assign each individual's genetic diversity to a portion of the identified clusters in a given data set. Uh, and so we tested 1 through 10 clusters. And the overwhelming uh, likelihood suggested that there's two distinct genetic clusters, basically. And this is a really, really striking pattern for uh, a species in which previous studies had suggested there wasn't much structure. This is really, really clear structure. There is basically two flavors of Lincoln. So just really quickly to orient you to the plot, it's uh, samples are arranged latitudinally, going from the Gulf of Alaska all the way down to Baja, California. And each one of these bars represents an individual and the relative proportion of their assignment to the two different clusters identified. And so in Lincoln, we have this <clears throat> striking pattern where there's basically three different types of individuals. We have individuals that assign very, very strongly these blue bars to the northern cluster, what we're calling it. We have individuals that assign very, very strongly to the southern cluster in this red-orange. And then there's these admixed individuals, which assign at 50-50, basically, to both clusters. Now, this is a, a striking pattern um, that is seen in cases where you sometimes have two different species producing sterile F1 hybrids that can't back cross. Uh, it's also a pattern that is seen in cases where chromosomal inversions are involved. And as I'll show you here down the road, this is the, the scenario we're dealing with. So 
another pattern that pops out pretty quickly is that the, there's an association with latitude in the distribution of these, these clusters. And we see that the steepest change in the distribution occurs uh, along the California coastline. So let's take a closer look at that. Oh, the image didn't quite show up as planned, but um, basically what's going on, I'm just going to go back to this slide, actually. Uh, what we see is that in Northern California, you have a high proportion of the solid blue individuals, the northern individuals, and you start to see more frequent, uh, uh, more frequent admixed individuals and then more southern cluster individuals. And there's this very distinct break right here. And this is near Point Reyes, California, just north of, of San Francisco Bay, where you basically go from around 60% assignment in the sampling site of the northern cluster and 40% southern to about 70% southern cluster and 30% northern cluster. So a very strong genetic break right around Point Reyes, California. So we'll just skip over this guy. This is basically showing that, but slide didn't quite translate going from a Mac to a PC. Okay, so we threw our data also into a principal component analysis, and it corroborated that really strong structure we saw in, in structure. So basically, we're looking at all 611 individuals here, and they're color-coded based on their assignment uh, in structure. So you have northern individuals in blue, red individuals, or sorry, southern individuals in red, and then admixed individuals in purple. And then the symbols show where they were actually sampled. Uh, and PC1 does a great job of separating them. We have the, the northern cluster on the left there, the southern cluster on the right of PC1, and then the admixed individual fall out right in between. And again, this is something you would expect to see in uh, two parent populations with admixed individuals in between or two different species with hybrid in between. It's also a pattern that is seen in chromosomal inversion. So getting uh, closer to what may be driving this, we, we calculated locus-specific FST values. And for all 16,000 16, loci based on the 42 different sampling sites. And what we saw was most of the genome is characterized by these very, very low FST values. It makes this tower that basically looks like the Burj Khalifa uh, centered around zero. So just a quick refresher, FST is a metric for uh, associating or uh, assessing differentiation. Uh, FST of zero is signal no differentiation and allele frequencies are basically the same. And FST of one would say that allele frequencies are fixed. There's this uh, very small little bump over here of higher FST values that we wanted to investigate. And so we, we performed a formal outlier scan and we used base scan and PCA adapt to do this, which are uh, two different flavors to identify candidate loci under divergent selection. Uh, base, uh, base scan uses a Bayesian regression approach, and PCA adapt uses a principal component analysis to identify loci as outliers. Uh, basically, we took the outliers identified in common between both of those and considered those candidate out, outlier loci. And these included 71 fixed differences between the northern and southern cluster, which is quite a few fixed differences uh, to see within, within a species. And so then we wanted to get a sense of how much the outliers were affecting the results. So we re-ran structure without the outliers. And that really strong signal <clears throat> of differentiation basically disappears, where it's very difficult to differentiate an individual collected from Alaska versus Oregon or Northern California or even Southern California. The proportion of assignment uh, is, is much more similar here. So that strong pattern of structure disappears. When we run a principal component analysis, again, without the outliers, that strong pattern along PC1 erodes as well. And there is some, some uh, association with latitude where you can see the more northern cluster individuals uh, to the left on the PC, but that, that distinction disappears. <clears throat> so the next step was we found this very, very strong population structure 
Uh, we wanted to know where these outliers, which were driving the population structure, where did they land on the genome? Uh, and so what we did is we assembled a, a draft genome. And I won't go over the details of the quality here, but it was a pretty decent uh, draft assembly. And again, it was great because we needed high molecular weight DNA. And then I got to go fishing again. And we were specifically targeting a, a male link on, uh, because they have a male-specific dupl duplication. And we wanted to capture that. And you can visually assess male link hod. They have a conical papilla. Um, that they use for external fertilization. So it was a male, got to go fishing again, really great. Um, and then, so it was a draft, a draft genome, so our assembly wasn't quite at what, what the gold standard for a genome assembly is, which is a, a chromosome scale assembly. Uh, to get around that, we, we took advantage of the fact that teleos are characterized by really high syntony, meaning that gene Conservate, the conservation gene order is pretty well conserved. And so we use three different teleos reference genomes with chromosome level assemblies to then scaffold our, our genome assembly, the link high genome assembly, onto these to get an idea of what our chromosomes possibly look like. We use three different species just in case there was some sort of bias in, in gene orientation uh, amongst those three species. But we we then generated uh, Manhattan plots and plotted all of our 16,000 loci onto these um, reference guided assemblies and wanted to see what the pattern of outliers looked like. Were they sparsely, uh, or sorry, were they distributed all throughout the genome? Was there one big spot where they were concentrated? Were they distributed in a few different high concentration spots? Um, the pattern was, was striking. So these are all 16,000 loci, and again, this is all link high genome. They're just scaffolded to these different reference genomes and named according, the chromosomes are named according to how they're named in their species, but the pattern is overwhelming. So just to orient you to this, the, on the y-axis for these plots is FSD, so those are those locus-specific FSD values we calculated, uh, and then on the x-axis are these chromosome scale food molecules, what uh, gives us an idea of what the link high genome chromosomes might look like. And there's this overwhelming pattern of the outliers, which are uh, colored in turquoise, aligning to a single chromosome scale food molecule in all three alignments. Um, and we also ran this with just using the raw genomes from all three of these species and saw the exact same pattern, where all of the, the outliers alone bas uh, align basically to a, cro to a single chromosome. Just taking a closer look at um, uh, each one of those chromosome scale pseudomolecules where our outliers align, it's, the, the story is basically you have this island of very, very strong differentiation in a sea of low differentiation and high gene flow. And this is really, really characteristic, as I've been kind of alluding to, to a chromosome one version. Uh, and I'll explain that here just in a minute. We also looked at uh, linkage disequilibrium by using an R-squared test and then plotting LD heat maps on each of the three chromosome scale pseudomolecules that harbored all of the outliers. And again, we see very strong linkage blocks that corroborate that pattern we saw in the Manhattan plots of strong uh, differentiation and linkage on, the, on those chromosome scale pseudomolecules. And so these patterns are, are really consistent with a, a chromosomal inversion, as I've been talking about. Uh, I'm not going to go diving too deep into the molecular details of chromosomal inversions, but basically it's, it's a type of chromosomal rearrangement where a segment of the chromosome becomes inverted. Pretty clever name. Uh, all the genes are still present, but they're just in an inverted order. So looking here at one of these examples, this is the normal order of genes, and then you have this chunk that's inverted here. And this has consequences and repercussions, uh, especially for what we call heterozygous individuals or heterokaryotype individuals, an individual that has one version inverted and the other not. Um, for homokaryotypes, there's not really any consequences, but for heterozygous individuals, if recombination occurs in the inversion region, and they will likely produce unbalanced gametes, which is lethal. And so this is why you see um, really 
you can have basically strong gene flow throughout the rest of the genome, but in this area of inverted and uninverted regions, gene flow is suppressed. Uh, and so you get, you can allow for divergence or maintenance of favorable allele combos. Um, and this has been seen more and more frequently as the pro proliferation of um, genome-wide data sets has, has exploded. A recent example is the Atlantic cod, and this structure plot should look pretty familiar um, in sense of what we saw in Lincod, where you have basically three different flavor, flavor of cod. You have these individuals who strongly assign to blue, individuals who strongly assign to orange, and these admixed individuals. And then in cod, this was associated with migratory phenotypes. Uh, there's also been quite a few inversions detected in bird systems. And they see similar patterns where you have PCAs where the homokaryotypes or individuals homozygous for inverted or uninverted regions uh, separate on PC1 and the admixed individuals fall in between. And this is another example of that. Once they remove the loci on the inverted region, it's very difficult to differentiate amongst the individuals. Same pattern, too, in the Manhattan plot um, with this willow warbler. So yeah, as I just said, they're fairly ubiquitous and play pretty important roles in diverse ecological and evolutionary processes. This is, a, this is a great review if you're interested in reading more about it by Weblin Rifter and Bernaches on inversion. So going quickly here, um, Lincod, as I mentioned earlier, the distribution of haplotypes, which we're, um, we're, we're, we're assuming that these are inversion haplotypes, uh, it follows a really, very, really, really strong latitudinal climb where the northern haplotype is, uh, dominates in the north. And as you move further south, you start to see the admixed individuals and southern cluster individuals. And it's that strong break point near point rays, um, as I mentioned, where the inversion haplotypes or cluster haplotypes, uh, the southern cluster becomes much more common. And this portion of the California coast, coastline is a well-known biogeographic break where there are sea surface temperature changes and upwelling. And it is a likely candidate that some of the uh, uh, alleles and genes on these inversion haplotypes may be associated with uh, uh, adaptation to, to, these bio, to these abiotic factors. So I have a little wacky waving inflatable arm man here just because this needs to be formally tested. Okay, so potential fishery implications. Going back to looking at the stock assessment models, uh, we remember that the Southern California link had a um, slow recovery than the North. And if we look at the makeup of most of California, south of Point Reyes, the Southern cluster haplotype or this, that inversion haplotype dominates in the South. So what that tells us is that for better or worse, the sub California basically, Southern California relies on recruitment of those Southern cluster haplotypes. And so management should focus on basically ensuring that recruitment from um, Southern cluster haplotypes can continue uh, or best practices for that to continue in order to help that recovery proceed along. So wrapping up, uh, basically omics helped us detect novel, uh, novel structure in Lincoln and very strong structure, uh, which is uh, associated with the latitudinal climb with a break, break near point rays, where uh, all the evidence points to uh, chromosomal inversion as being the culprit uh, behind this strong structure. And that slow recovery we saw in the south dock for Lincoln it could be linked to the distinct genetic units, uh, basically that the southern cluster haplotypes need to recruit to the southern portion, portion of California for that stock to, to continue to recover. We're currently working on sequencing the southern cluster genome to better characterize this putative inversion, uh, and, which meant I got to go fishing again, which was great. 
and currently working on investigating the adaptive nature of the inversion. So that, with that, I'll take any questions. And if you would like to read more about the article, um, follow this link. Or if you have more questions about LINCOD or uh, the techniques we use, I'm happy to answer those in a call or an email. So now I'll take any questions. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you so much, Gary. That was extremely interesting research and really great presentation. So like Gary said at this time, we're happy to take any questions that you might have for him or any leftover questions or lingering questions you all might have for our first talk from Becca. So it seems like we have some folks who are typing in the general chat right now. So I hope that they are um, looking up some questions. So we'll just wait one moment. Oh, okay, we have a bunch of questions coming in. So we have a question from, I believe this is Joseph. So very nice presentation, Gary. Have you identified any functional genes within the inversion region? Thanks, Joseph. Uh, that's on the chopping block right now. Uh, there's almost certain, it's a pretty big segment, 15 megabases. Um, there's definitely functional genes on that. We, we're looking at what may be behind this and what genes may be involved. Okay, great. We have a question here from Wes. So, hey, Gary, great job. How are you guys planning on characterizing the adaptive nature of the inversion, given that it is so big with presumably a lot of genes? Great question, Wes. Uh, the starting point, I think, is to look at those, those fixed differences on that region uh, and identify whether or not they land in coding regions or possibly promoters um, as a good starting point. Um, yeah, that's where I think we, we're, we're heading right now. A okay, couple more questions here. We have a question from Tracy. So Tracy, is this in regards to both Becca and Gary's talk? I don't know if you want to just... Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll give this one to Gary then. So um, anyone can answer. Okay, great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so I guess we'll have Gary, you answer this one first. Could you talk about how these types of analyses support species or ecosystem management and has it supported or informed any kind of management yet? Yeah, so great question. Um, there, LinkHot are up for assessment again, and currently they're, they're changing the uh, management boundary to better reflect, to take into account um, both based on this genomic data I just presented and life history data from a colleague, Laurel Lamb. Um, it, it seems pretty pretty uh, likely that that, like I had said, that the haplotype, inversion haplotypes carry some fitness advantages, and it's a good idea to take that into account, and that's what's going on. Um, in terms of uh, ecosystem management, and this kind of relates to a question uh, I saw about uh, where the break occurs in California, um, it, there, there's really, really strong upwelling in that area, and it's a well-known biogeographic break. Well, there's biogeographic breaks going from Point Conception up to Cape Mendocino, basically. Uh, and so I think this, this break has implications or is related to a bunch of other species. And so um, taking that into account and um, in terms of management it is probably a, a pretty pretty uh, would would broadly apply to a bunch of different species. Thanks, Gary. And I think we'll also pass that question off to Becca and Sarah from Tracy too. Could you just touch on how your analyses have or are going to uh, support species or ecosystem management, and if it has done so already? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly um, speculate on what I think would be really good for the future. I mean, as of now, um, network analyses as applied to corals is very new. So I, I don't think that's been used in practice at all, although Sarah is much more um, 
in the field so she can jump in. But um, I think ideally what would be really great is if we got a, a good handle on maybe some sort of um, bacterial species that are like canaries in the coal mine a little bit for um, when a disease outbreak is going to happen. And we could figure that out with network science. Um, basically sampling and doing 16S as sort of a monitoring method could be a really great way to sort of pinpoint where the next outbreak is going to be, um, which cor corals are more vulnerable to disease. Um, so we can use some of those sort of maybe rarer taxa um, as, uh, as in, in the sense of monitoring. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then I can jump in real quick on um, kind of where network science is being used in kind of the, the larger coral science field. So um, I've used it mostly to look at coral symbiosis networks with their zoosome celli, um, but it's also been used to look at larval dispersal and disease dispersal. Um, so it's especially with the stony coral tissue loss disease outbreak. So I know a couple of papers have come out using that to understand the disease spread through the Florida Keys, and I'm sure that information will be very valuable to managers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Becca, Sarah, and Gary. Really appreciate you all taking some time uh, to answer these questions today and to also present on your incredible research um, to further the only commission here at NOAA. Um, so with that, we are a little past the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our seminar for today. So thank you all so much for joining today, and another huge thanks to Becca, Sarah, Gary, and also Tracy for uh, doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work and getting this uh, webinar up and running. So just a reminder to our audience, the NOAA Omics Seminar Series takes place on the third Wednesday of every month at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So our next seminar will be on August 18th, 2021, and it will include two presentations from researchers at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratories. So I hope you can all join us at that time. Thank you so much, everybody.